Hello there, explorers. Welcome to another wonderful Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Jen, and today, friends, we are going to be talking about all about this habitat right behind me. We are looking at, what do you think we are, friends? We thought tide pools? Absolutely, we are looking at tide pools today. Now, joining me is also Soraya, who is going to be helping us talk all about these animals by showing us all these really cool pictures and media today and she went ahead and waved hello to all of you and if all of you are interested in also participating we would love to be able to hear from you too you can always go on ahead and text us down below 562-286-1838 you can also go on ahead and email questions down below at live at lbaop.org um but the immediate way to get a hold of us is probably our text all right friends so Welcome, like I said, today we are talking all about these wonderful habitats, tide pools. Now this is a very special view that we have, I'll step off to the side, because you can see, well, basically right where the rocks are up there and our water. So we're kind of looking at a deeper view right here, but if you had to think about a tide pool, what kind of comes to mind when you think about a tide pool habitat? Maybe a pool of water, right? Is your pool of water super huge? Or maybe is it kind of medium size? Maybe small, right? And tide pools will come in all of those. They'll be big, they'll be small, they will be medium. But as you think about that word tide pool, what kind of pops into your mind? Aha, there we go. We have some medium and small and large tide pools all around. A common theme that I'm seeing here that you too may be seeing are lots of rocks and water, right? So here, what else do you happen to notice about water doing over those rocks? Ooh, some of it's kind of spilling out. Do you notice anything else? They're getting trapped in all these little pools, right? So all of these areas right here, right where the water and the rocks meet right off of land, it's where we have these things called tide pools. Now, of course, wouldn't they be called wave pools? Because you just see all these waves just kind of crashing on in and creating all of these pools. Where does that tide part come into play? Hmm. Well, friends, have you heard about the tides before? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. If not, that's okay, because we're learning today as a group, and scientists learn new things all the time. And so with that, friends, tides are just basically the moon's way of pulling the water up or down in our, off of our beaches, off of our coast. And that happens all over the world, depending upon where the moon and the earth are rotating around. And so with that, sometimes we'll get really, really high tides or the water goes up on our beaches really, really high. Other times we'll get really super low tides where the water goes back really, really low. So here we have a time lapse where we can see, it's going by really fast, all of this water coming up onto our beaches. So when we have the water go all the way up, that's gonna be high tide and this, friends, it's going to be low tide where we have all of this beach exposed and we have all of the water way back there. So right now it's low tide and then we're watching it go. It's still going. Kind of takes a while, doesn't it? Hmm. And then eventually, ta-da, we have high tide. All right, friends. So everywhere around the world, tides are a little bit different. And it's all depending upon where, where you live, right? So here off of California and the West Coast, we have two high tides and two low tides a day. So friends who like to do math, if we have four tide changes, high, low, high, low, within 24 hours, how many hours is it between? If you're thinking six, you got it. So for six hours a day, those animals that live in these tide pool areas are having the water slowly come up on them. And then it's nice and high tide where they're in pools of water like we saw. And then during the other six hours where the water goes all the way back, now maybe they're not in as much water or maybe they're not in any water at all. Maybe they're just stuck on a rock somewhere, right? So 
there's high tide and there's low tide. Oh, thank you, Soraya. Here's a great picture of what it's like for some of the animals that are um, they're trying to to make it during low tide, right? So believe it or not, tideful animals can live out of water, which is really kind of crazy to think about, but they can. Do you recognize any of the animals that you see here in our low tide picture? Hmm. We'd love to hear from you if you want to go on ahead and share your thoughts with us. Or if you're interested in sharing maybe a thought of like an experience that you had at a tide pool, if you've ever gone tide pooling before. Now I know we don't have tide pools everywhere around the world. They are a special habitat or a place where animals live. So it's not everywhere. So sometimes it can be hard to explore. And so we appreciate you exploring with us today on this really unique and extreme habitat, which we'll go into how they're extreme in a little bit. But I think having animals, ocean animals out of water is pretty extreme, isn't it? I think so. I mean, my gosh, now you may recognize our sea stars right here, right? We have an orange one right here. You may have noticed a few of the purple ones right here. I love seeing the purple ones. I feel like I always see brown ones. Brown ones are great too, right? And maybe there's some like pink ones. They, these sea stars come in lots of different colors, but these ones can live out of water for, you know, little less than six hours, but still that's pretty incredible. And then we have these friends. Mm, any guesses to what these are? These look very different outside of water than they actually do inside of water. Any thoughts? Ooh, I think James had an idea that these were anemones and you got it. They are sea anemones. Bonus points for you because they are hard to actually see. Um, let's see if, Soraya, if you can put up, ah, you read my mind. Perfect, right? Here is what an anemone looks like when it is actually open, right? We saw closed versions of them. They almost look like, well, green donuts, right? Where they looked, oh, you're so quick. Where they look like they are very round and then they kind of have like that donut hole in the middle, right? Um, and so when they're open though, they go on ahead and they look completely different. They almost look like a flower where they have all of these tentacles, right? That help them to be able to catch some of their food. But James is asking, how come sea, how come sea anemones squirt? when you touch them? And that is a great question and also a great observation, which means that you've probably done it or at least seen someone do that before. Well, James, let's go on ahead and let's talk a little bit more about that. Now, these animals that do have to live out of water, they have to have some pretty special superpowers, right? Now, we as scientists, as much as we like to talk about superpowers, we have a special word for that. And that special word is called adaptation. Maybe you've heard it before, right? What does that word adaptation mean? Hmm. Now I know for me, I, a lot of times I hear people say, well, it's the way that animals adapt to their habitat, right? A way that they're able to, to find a way to survive in their home. And it is, and it's a very special way. It's something that is on us that helps us to be able to survive in our habitat. So for example, if I go on ahead and think about Hmm, how do I breathe? Well, I use my nose, but that's really for sniffing. So what do we have inside of us that we can use our nose or our mouth to do to help us to be able to breathe and get that oxygen? Our lungs, right? So our lungs are the way that we breathe. Now I think there's a little fishy friend somewhere in here. Lisa comes by, aha, there he is, right? There's our little fishy friend that's trying to hide right now. But fish, what do they have to use? Do they normally have lungs? No, right? They normally don't have lungs. What do they have instead? Aha, there it is. Gills, right? So they have gills that help them to breathe the oxygen out of the water. So that's their adaptation, their superpower that helps them to be able to get that oxygen out of the water versus us, we use our lungs. Now, James, to get back to your question, right? These Anemones right here, this is what they look like when they're all out in underneath the water, right? They're looking to capture their food right there. They're able to just kind of live in the water and be happy and just kind of trap their food whenever it comes by. But when they're out of the water, they kind of look like that, right? They look like those smushy little donuts right there. And part of that is because these animals are mostly made up of water. Yeah, they're mostly water. So 
So during those six hours when they are out of water, they have to find ways to be able to keep the water that they have inside them to stay happy and healthy before the next high tide comes up, right? When that water comes back on up and covers them again. So with that, friends, um, these sea anemones kind of tuck in their tentacles and you can tuck in your tentacles with me right they tuck in all their tentacles and they get nice and small like a little donut and that is one adaptation one way that kind of helps them to conserve or keep the water that they have inside them now if we look really closely i mean closely do you see what i'm seeing as well on these sea anemones right there do you see all those like little speckly parts all of those speckly parts. What do you think that might be? Hmm. Well, if you're thinking sand or shells, you're right. Yeah, sea anemone will actually go on ahead and put sand or shells on them. But why? I mean, I think they look pretty as they are green, don't you? So maybe it might be a way to kind of, well, just kind of look a little bit different. But they also go on ahead and do that for protection too. Having that sand or the shells kind of acts as like little armor to help them keep that water in. So they can scooch up like a little donut and put all their tentacles in. They can use sand or rocks or shells all around them to help them keep that water in. Bonus, it can also act as a way to reduce sun from keeping them warm so they stay nice and cool that way too. But James, when you're talking about, you know, them kind of squirting out water, what happens is when you go on ahead, let's just say you poke one of these, boop, right, that water squirts out. That's actually a way for a sea anemone to protect itself. Pretty crazy, right? Yeah. So sea anemones, they don't have hands, they don't have legs, they can't be like, no, get away, or eh, goodbye, predator, don't come near me, right? And so what they do is if there's maybe a seagull that's interested in munching at it, and the seagull's hop, hop, hopping along or walking along, and it sees that delicious anemone, maybe it might use that beak to try to poke at our sea anemone friend. And when it does, that sea anemone squirts out water, and that's its way of saying, get away from me, right? It wants to stay happy and healthy during that time. But the tricky part is, friends, when you go on ahead and when it gets poked, it also loses some of that water that it was trying to save for those six hours, right? So it's kind of tricky because it wants to protect itself by squirting that water because it's afraid. But at the same time, it doesn't want to squirt out too much water because then it may have a harder time to survive. So James, hopefully that answers your question about how and why anemones might squirt water. Wow, what a great experience that you shared with us. So thank you. All right, Tia's asking, what do anemones eat? That is a great question, Tia. And you also asked, are they poisonous? Now here's another wonderful shot that Sarai has given us of another sea anemone. And this one's kind of nice. I love videos, but this you can actually see this sea anemone parts really well. And here we can see all of those tentacles. And friends, did you know that the middle of our sea anemone right here is actually its mouth? Yeah, it is, it's its mouth, its mouth. Now friends, these sea anemones are also very simple creatures. So even though it's its mouth, it's also, can I show you a secret? Where it poops. Mm hmm yeah, it's where it poops too. They eat and they basically poop out of that same hole, but it's like a U shape. So it goes around and then it comes back out again. So a U shaped gut is what we kind of like to call it in one way then it goes through and then it comes out that same end very simple way for these animals to be able to digest their food but that's because their food well is very very small for the most part we have all of these tentacles now do these tentacles remind you of um of any other animal that also might have tentacles hmm. kind of comes to mind i'm kind of thinking octopus no wait oh looks like Soraya was thinking the same thing octopus but this octopus doesn't look like our sea anemone does it oh oh oh, oh. maybe no no what's another animal that maybe might have tentacles that we can think of hmm 
Maybe a jelly? Mmm, right? Da da da! You got it! It is a jelly! Or a jellyfish, or sea jelly, how you ever like to call it, right? But these jellies right here, they come in all sorts of different shapes and colors, kind of like our sea anemones do. But they have all of these beautiful tentacles. And these tentacles do the same thing on a jelly as they do for our sea anemone. So what is that exactly? Seems like, Tia, you might have a general idea of what it might be, right? To maybe sting their food, right? So they go on ahead and they use those tentacles and they catch their food. Maybe sometimes it's plankton, things that are so small that you can't even barely see with your eyeballs. Maybe some teeny tiny animals are swimming on by that get caught inside of these tentacles. For some, it might be really, really small fish. For others, it might be whatever can basically kind of drop or come in their area that they can eat that's small and that they can sting. Because Tia, even though it stings, it's actually not poisonous. Because poisonous is something that you eat and that you may get sick or that you may not feel well, right? Poison. But if you get stung, that's actually venom or venomous. And so this has venom inside of it. So as it stings, it's actually stinging lots of little venom inside of, uh, inside of the, the fish or the plankton. And then it's able to sting it up and then bring it into that very middle right there, their mouth. Mm. So it sounds like, friends, we've talked a lot of different adaptations, right? A lot of different things on our sea anemone that really help it to survive. We've had a chance to talk about how it stings and eats, which is pretty cool. But if we think about how it's able to survive in that tide pool habitat during the low tide when, it's, um, when it doesn't have water for six hours, do you remember what kind of comes to mind? Mm. Well, we remember, right, they are tucked in, their tentacles are tucked in, right? And then they're able to have all of that sand or shell on the outside of them that helps them to survive. So I'm going to write that down on my little whiteboard here. If we're thinking about different kinds of animals. I'm going to draw my little anemone here. With a little mouth in the middle. And I'm going to think about my adaptations for my anemone. And that's going to be, right, it can tuck in its tentacles. And then it can also wear shells and sand. That's pretty cool. I wish I could wear shells and sand sometimes. Though maybe it might get messy in the car. But that's okay. I think it would be fun anyways. You can always just vacuum anyways. All right, so we've talked about our sea anemone friend right, right here, at least my version of a sea anemone. Let's go on ahead and let's look at an animal that has very different adaptations. I'll go on ahead and I'll let Soraya choose. Mmm. I know, dealer's choice. Da -da -da! What a beautiful friend to choose next. Thank you. Anyone know what this animal is right here? Ow, a little pokey. You're thinking sea urchin, you got it, right? So if we had to think about this animal, is it in water right now? No! So another superpower is that our sea urchins can also live out of water, which I think is absolutely incredible and so extreme and bonkers all at the same time. I'm always in awe of these animals right here. So sea urchins, hmm, what do you think they might use to be able to survive outside of water in the low tide? Any guesses? Mm. Well, let's see. Ow! Keep on bumping into that sea urchin right there. Hmm, wait a minute. You probably already see it. All of these spikes, right? So these spikes are great at protecting our sea urchin from predators. Yeah, much like how our sea anemone was able to kind of squirt out water, right? Our sea urchin has all of these spikes that it has to be able to protect itself, which is great in case, you know, it comes out of the water and any predators are around looking for a tasty meal, such as this urchin. But friends, one thing that you can't see that's hard to see is that under these spikes, they actually have a really hard body. Yeah, let me see. Oh, I think I have one, which is pretty incredible. So even though we see a purple right there, I'm going to go to my document camera so you can see it. Here, 
is the actual skeleton of our sea anemone. And I'll zoom in so you can see it a lot better. There we go. So this is our sea urchin, well, basically skeleton. It's also known as a test. Kind of like that one you would take, right? But a little bit different as there are no grades for, for this sea urchin here. Only a very hard skeletal body. So right where you see all of these little circles, that is where a little spike would come out. So our sea urchin has lots and lots of spikes that it can have all over its body. Now, all of these little holes, these miniature holes that you see everywhere around here, that's actually where its feet kind of come out. Yeah, you're like, wait, well, I didn't see shoes. I didn't see legs, right? But believe it or not, they do have feet. They have what we like to call tube feet. Hmm, does that word tube feet sound familiar to anyone? I kind of think of sea stars when I think of tube feet. All of those little feet that help our sea stars to be able to walk around right here, right? All of these are tube feet. Definitely more than two, right? Tube feet that we have all around here. And our sea anemones, sea anemones, sea urchins have that all over their entire body, which help them to do what? What do you think these tube feet do? Anything that you're noticing right now? Hmm. I definitely see our tube feet sticking, sticking onto that wall right there. I'm also seeing those tube feet kind of move and we can see them here here they're really hard to see so sometimes scientists have to put on their extra eyes yep their extra eyes to be able to see even closer on these extreme animals they're teeny tiny tube feet so they look a little bit different you can see one here another one here they almost look like i don't know almost like pieces of string right but those are actually all their little feet that they have all around their entire body so what do you think the tube feet help our sea urchins to do Probably like we mentioned, our sea stars helps them to walk, right? Helps them to stick. Ooh, we can see those little wigglies move around. Like right here. Do you see that? That's pretty incredible. We can see them here. Like you gotta look really closely, right? So we have all of these little two feet all over here. We can see them wiggling around. And they are also trying to catch their favorite food, which is Seaweed. Yes, seaweed is one of their all-time favorite foods. They love to catch seaweed as it floats down from the seaweed off to the ocean floor. Or sometimes it gets caught in tide pools. And they will use those little feet. They'll wiggle them all around and they'll grab that seaweed and they could put it on top of themselves. Now maybe they might use that to hide for a little bit or me, and then they'll go on ahead and they'll take it all around to the bottom. Yep, the very bottom, hard to see underneath here, but they will take it down to the bottom. And underneath, there's actually a hole of our sea urchin on the bottom, and that's where its mouth is. So our mouth of our sea urchin is underneath, and this one actually might just be eating some seaweed itself. Right, yum, 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 yum. Just munching away on its seaweed. So friends, our sea urchin has some really neat adaptations, right? We can go on ahead and add them to our little tide pool. And I'll just go on ahead, whoopsies, I should probably zoom out, right? I might just add my spiky ball right here. There we go, there's my sea urchin. And it has spikes to defend predators, and then it also has a hard, basically it's a shell, because it, ha it has squishy parts on the inside. Hard shell to protect itself too from all of that water. All right, we can look at one more fun animal. Let's see, which one does Soraya want to choose? Hmm. We've looked at a squishy friend on the outside, like our sea anemone. We've now had a chance to look at a hard pokey friend. Aha! Looks like we're squishy and kind of pokey all in one, right? So here we go on ahead and we have what, friends? A snail! Yeah, sea snail. What a great way to end on, right, for our class. A sea snail! 
definitely one of my all-time favorite animals. How could you not just love this cute face? Not really seeing a face? It is there. I promise you. They do have cute little stock eyes that may be hard to see. But with snails, they actually have a more picturesque face underneath the water. Above water, it can be kind of tricky to see, but they have a squishy body, right? So if they have a squishy body, what do you think about the shell? Is it hard? Yeah, it's pretty hard, right? So believe it or not, friends, these, these sea snails actually make their own shell. Yes, they do, they make their own shell. A lot of friends think, well, maybe it's the hermit crab that makes it, but sea snails make its own shell. When they are itty bitty, teeny tiny, eensy weensy little snails, they will start out only maybe the size of that little tip right there. And as they get older, and as they get bigger, eat more tasty algae, because that's what they like to eat, algae, they'll go on ahead and grow bigger and bigger, and their shell will slowly grow bigger and bigger along with them. And over time, we have this very, I don't say very old, but it is a older sea snail that we have right here because it's grown all of the shell for its entire life. Now, you may think, algae is what it eats? Yeah, they play a very important role in the tide pool. Yep, here we can see, oh, just this little antenna, barely peeking out. Snails, they can be kind of a shy crowd, but hey, you know, I can relate. That's totally fine. So we have all these snail friends, like this chestnut cowrie that we have off of uh, California here, absolutely gorgeous. And it is trying to find a place to eat. Now these abalone are also pretty great too, right? Again, big shell, and then kind of a squishy underneath right here, also eating seaweed too, right? Now, not all snails eat the same seaweeds. They all can eat different seaweeds, which how it kind of makes them kind of like the gardeners of our kelp forests or gardeners of our tide pools is they help keep the different kind of seaweeds in balance, which is pretty cool, right? But for all of these friends right here, they have that hard shell to protect themselves. So if they might protect themselves from predators, they're out of water, how else might that hard shell help protect them? Hmm. They're on a rock here that hard shell protect a very squishy wet body if you're thinking well maybe it might lock that moisture lock that wetness in you are right it's a way that they can help stay wet throughout the entire time by having their hard shell protect them and what's really crazy friends is that hard shell will actually keep them really nice and cool too it doesn't heat up very much as the sun maybe might be beating down on it. So the shell is really incredible. It soaks up that heat so that way it doesn't get too hot. The body inside doesn't get too hot. And once they are kind of hunkered down on top of a rock, it also helps them to keep the wetness on in. So let's go on ahead and draw our last animal today. That's going to be a cute and cuddly snail. All right. So. I will draw a snail shell here. I'll draw mine from the side. It's all out and about. It's a very happy sea snail. And there it is. We'll even draw some food underneath it just for kicks. There we go. Have some algae. That's probably why it's so happy because it has a nice little snack. And for it, right? It has another hard shell that helps really kind of protect its squishy body. Hmm. Now, friends, as we look at some of these adaptations, do you see any similarities or differences between any of them? Hmm. Well, for me, shell stands out, right? All of these three that we looked at are really kind of talking about shells, and shells are a nice way for them to protect themselves in one way or another, right? Now, two of them actually have squishy bodies, which I think is also very interesting and really cool. The animals that have squishy or even hard bodies can go on ahead and stay out of water for six hours and then can be underwater for another six. Oh my goodness, that is one extreme environment. So 
show friends and scientists. Thank you so very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure talking about tide pools. If you have any other questions, feel free to go on ahead and email us at live at lbaop.org, and we'll be able to get back to your questions and comments then. Thanks so much, and we'll see you